All right, well, thanks for coming. My name's Rick Sanders, and uh, I'm, I've been asked to, to talk about sort of legal stuff. Um, my background is pretty general in intellectual property and computer issues, so I, I, I pretty, it's broad enough probably to, to, to at least take a decent stab at, at your questions. Um, and I, th I think the idea was that this would be more of a Q&A, but I do do have a kind of boring presentation which I can kind of launch into. About platypuses? Well, pl platypus is sort of is sort of a metaphor is sort of a metaphor that made sense last night. Um, so I, I don't know how how much sense it makes today, but last minute metaphors are best. Well, well, well see that's the problem. It was last minute, but that's not last minute anymore. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, mean, I, I thought the presentation is, is about sort of the inter interaction between the law and, and software development. And the reason why I used a platypus as my symbol here is that software is like, a, in, in the law, software is like a platypus. It, it doesn't fit neatly into any of the, the categories that intellectual property law was designed for um, and it, it makes it you know it's it, it makes life hard for judges it makes life hard for lawyers I, I love it because it's it's complicated and difficult and it's kind of a big puzzle that you have to kind of work through but um, it is it's frustrating for everybody else so that's why it's um, that's why the platypus is is our symbol today software development is like it's not quite it's not quite patented it's not quite copyright, it's not quite trade secret, it's, it's something sort of all its own. Do uh, you want me to just kind of launch into the, into the presentation? Do you guys start asking questions? Do you want to start asking questions right off the bat? Presentation, all right. And then we'll interrupt you. Then you're, okay. <laughs> all right. So, hey, right. That's me. I uh, work for a law firm up in Nashville. Uh, me, and my, me and my partner, lovely and attractive Tara Aaron. And I do the litigation side, and she does the transaction side. So the idea is that if she does her job, I should never see you. But fortunately, people do not take legal advice, and that keeps me in business. So I, I, do, the, I do the lawsuits. I do the litigation. And if, if you're ever interested, I, I do keep a pretty regular blog. I try to aim it at people who are not lawyers but are interested. So it's, it's, it's not fluffy, um, but it's, it's not for lawyers either. Um, so yeah, so this is, where I was, this is where I was last night, I was trying to think of you know, what, what's, what's, I, what's software like, what's software's relationship with IP like, and, and um, at first I thought it was like the Maginot Line in Belgium. Okay, few few people get that. Okay, but then it's not quite right. It sort of, so it sort of it belongs everywhere and it belongs nowhere. That's that's where that's where software development is. And there's at least it's, there's lots of little specific, very very specific laws out there. Some are state specific um, that we're just not going to have time to get into. Uh, particularly if you want to get into internet issues, which is another completely different issue, which I could spend another hour talking about. But so these are three main areas of, of, of IP that affect. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. You're, you're thinking, I've been told that everybody's going to be interested in the um, Apple Samsung case. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think. Two, two, two issues. Obviously, it's going to be more important for um, for hardware, for devices like well, like like this. And what we learned, um, first of all, that thing's going to be on appeal. I mean, I, I hate to draw too much from that case because more and more is coming out about it, and it's looking weirder and weirder, and it's already weird to begin with. Um, when it comes to trade dress, we're actually talking about two different things. And in the, in the Apple case, there were two different sorts of trade dress. One is a design patent. And design patents are like regular patents, except you remove the word useful and you add in the word ornamental. And 
people used to think they were kind of lame. They're easier to get, but they still cost a lot, and they still take time, and they're hard to enforce. Because until like two years ago, nobody knew quite what the test was, and people used to laugh at them. I mean, I mean, all the other forms of IP would kind of laugh at them. Be, you know, maybe behind you know design patents back, you know, patents, utility patents, and copyrights would even trademark would kind of laugh at it. Um, but the, the Apple Samsung case. Um, I think 24% of the, of the billion dollar in damages was owing to a design patent. So people are now rethinking maybe design patents are, are worth more. Um, but you have to go to the USPTO, and I'll talk about that a little, in a little bit. But you still have to go to the USPTO. You've got to pay filing fees. You've got to pay a lawyer to do all the back and forth. Trade dress, Coke bottles your, is your example of a trade dress. You see a Coke bottle, you think, Coke. I mean, you, you know, you, nobody can have a Coke bottle shaped like that anymore because it's, it's, the shape is so tied to a particular product. So it's actually in the realm of trademark. And we, I, don't, I didn't put, talk about trademark here, but trademark is, is really, in some ways, the, it's, the most unu it's, it's the least IP of the, IP of the types of IP because it's really kind of a business tort. It's, it's um, um, you know, I, I'm your customer. And I see a mark, and I think, your goods, your services. And once that happens, there's a trademark. You don't even have to go register it. Common law says there's a trademark. This is the oldest kind of IP. It goes back in the Middle Ages. You know, it goes back to the old palming off. You know, if I, I'm selling apples, and my apples suck, but your apples are great. And I say, oh, these aren't my apples. They're your apples. You know, I'm lying to people. That, that's, that's how trademark got started. You can, now, you can sue me and say, hey, you, you were... You were palming off, claiming your products for something that they weren't. And now it's become abstracted to this idea of, of marks, Apple, of course, a very strong mark, but also trade dress. But trade dress is hard. Trade dress is hard to get. It's pretty unusual because um, you have to prove that people, co consumers, are actually making the association. If you've got a nice, strong mark like Apple, you don't have to prove that. Everybody just assumes that's a distinctive mark and you're, you're there. But with, with trade dress, you actually have to figure out some way to prove that consumers are making the connection. And that's really hard. I mean, how are you supposed to do that? You're supposed to like, ask like 1,000 people to come into the courtroom and say, yep, 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 nope, yep, yep, yep. You got to hire experts. They got to do surveys. They always blow the surveys. I mean, about 50 or two-thirds of the times, they blow the surveys and they, their testimony is thrown out and it fails. Um, I don't know. Trade dress, no, but maybe design patents are, are, are maybe they're not getting picked on anymore. It depends. I'm, I'm, I'm holding judgment until I see what the Ninth Circuit does with the Apple-Samsung case. Because, boy, the jury went nuts on the design patent. Sorry, did that, that remotely answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. You had your hand up first. Long, long before, yes. long before um, uh, there probably that was a, a patentable or an IP issue that is now associated yeah. intricately with the Coca-Cola company. But yet, if I if something like the iPad, which was asserted the the rectangular shape with round corners, asserted that now that is something that's associated with Apple. Yet that's only been around for three years. Yeah, and uh, what's interesting, we don't know why um, Apple lost the trade dress. Jury actually went against Apple on trade dress. They went for Apple on the design patent. So maybe that's what they're thinking. The problem with juries is they're kind of a black box. We don't know why they do things. They just come back with mystical numbers and say it's a billion dollars. And, and, um, but it was, it, was the, it was the design patent. So Apple had previously gotten a design patent. Apple's become very aggressive with their patents. And so they got the design patent. And there, it doesn't matter. All that matters for, for a design patent is that you were allegedly the first person to come up with it, come up with the design. Whereas I think you're absolutely right, your, your instincts are exactly right about trade dress, that it's been around a while is sort of necessary to build up the goodwill so that you have this, this intrinsic connection that consumers are drawing between your product and, and you, the producer of the product.
functions, they often, you know, look the same or look very similar. But, yeah. You know, No. I mean, that's the thing. You can't own what's already in nature. And that's what's so kind of controversial about the idea of having a trade dress. I think it's a bit could, more to it than just the rounded edges, but it's a pretty broad patent that, that Apple won on. Can, can you go, uh, you're, I'm not getting, you're talking about they won the design patent, but not the trade dress. Not the trade dress. But I have no idea how the two distinct are distinct from each other. Okay, so a design patent is um, something you get from the government. So you have to go to the government, you, you fill out an application, you hire a lawyer, you pay the lawyer a pretty good amount of money. They're cheaper to get, and they're cheaper, therefore, than utility patents, but still, filing fees and, and uh, attorney's fees are expensive. And you say to them, I've got something that's ornamental, nobody's ever had this design before, and um, nobody ever, if, if they wear in the, in the, at the time. And then if you convince the USPTO of that, shazam, you got a, you got a patent. Yeah. It might take a few years. That's the other thing. It takes a few years. Uh, but then when you got it, you can go out and enforce it on people and sue them. Trade dress is something that hap arises organically. It arises between your relationship with your, with, between your, your, your customers and your product. And your, your customers see your product and say, that shape, that color combined with shape. Recently, we had a ruling about red soles, yeah. red soles on the shoes. Um, um, there are also some, some restaurant concepts have, have managed to succeed. You say, ah, I see that, and I immediately think a certain kind of quality. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what trademarks and trade dress are supposed to say is, a certain quality, not necessarily high quality, but a certain experience, a certain level of quality that is now associated with that mark or, or trade dress. And it happens organically. You can try to get it registered. It's sort of an interesting thing you can do. You can get it registered. That gives you a certain amount of nas national coverage, but it happens organically. It has to happen organically. The government can't, doesn't grant it to you. Yeah. It's through your efforts, your marketing, your advertising. Thank you. Another thing I, I wondered after the uh, decision came down from the Ninth Circuit was it just seems a little weird to me. We've got this Korean company and we've got this California company and so we're going to have an all-California jury rule against the Koreans and I'm like, well, we've got a little home field bias here now, don't we? Yeah, it's, um, you know, um, I've been thinking about that and uh, I used to practice in California. I used to practice in, in Santa Clara County. And I, what's weird about patent cases is that the plaintiff almost always wins if it, go, if it gets to trial. It doesn't really matter where you are. Many lawsuits, for example, are brought in Eastern District of Texas or Eastern District of Virginia, not because that's where they're located, but because there are very friendly juries there, but still. Plaintiffs, juries just kind of go with the plaintiff on patent cases. And what's weird is they do it even if it's a declaratory action. That is, the, the person likely to be accused of infringement brings the lawsuit preemptively. Juries just seem to, like, seem to go with whoever took, took action. Now the question is, what, is there some kind of home field advantage? Part of me, I'm split. Um, part well, it, it seems like if I was uh, involved in the appeal, I would be like, You've got people literally 30 miles away from headquarters here that are actually involved in the economy there. And so, yeah, yeah. whose side are they going to take? It's, it's quite obvious. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of split on that just because people. Well, I'd argue pe the hell out of it. People in, in, in Santa Clara County are mostly from somewhere else. I mean, it's sort of a weird thing about Silicon Valley. I grew up there, so I'm actually unusual in that I was born and raised there. Uh, but my dad's not from there. My mom's not from there. Um, a lot of my friends are from India or from China or, or, or somewhere else. But the jury pool is a little different. The jury pool tends to be made up of a lot more homies. Um, and I remember being involved in a case there. It was awful. Our client was from India, uh, from southern India. Um, 
And we somehow in Silicon Valley had almost an entirely white jury. I don't know how you do that. And our, the, we got killed because the plaintiff made our, our client look like the sort of outsider from, from India. And here they are being successful. And, and there's a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are kind of resentful of, of you know, people who live in Santa Clara County are sometimes resentful of Silicon Valley. Um, nice. And, and um, now that was several years ago. Silicon Valley has, has changed even more since I, I left. Uh, but I, I remember being a little, a little stunned by that. So, yeah, home cooking. Um, federal court is supposed to be less home cooking. You've never been home cooked until you've been home cooked in uh, Texas state court because uh, the, the judge hates you. But, um, yeah, may, maybe. Maybe. If, if so, you know, Samsung, Samsung should have... Um, they should have, I guess the only thing they could have done is brought the lawsuit somewhere else. But it's not going to be a factor at all on appeal. That's, we, we assume, we get very naive about juries. We assume that, now this may be unusual because the foreman did some strange things. But generally we assume juries are wonderful, hardworking, honest, f completely fair people. We just, we just assume that. I, I thought they were regular people. <laughs> yeah. No, no, honestly, we, we really think of them as, as more than that. Yeah. Well, I think we do that because otherwise we'd go insane. If we questioned every single jury decision, we would never hear the end of it. So there has to be something that's the end. And with juries, you know, the, the jury decisions are very rarely overturned. I'll just, because, because of that, it's a black box. We don't know what they were thinking. Um, juries um, don't. They, get, they don't like jury instructions very much. Patent cases especially so because the jury instructions are massive and you know, the issues are very technical. Um, as technical as my things got roundy corners and they yeah. stole it. Yeah. And I, that's, yeah, you know, I the, mean, when, the, when they were warming... This, this is not a very technical case. Now, I, I admit, only one of the patents was when, really very technical. When the, they were warming up to the, the verdict being released, I was making jokes on Facebook that the, the lawyer got up there in front of the jury and said, oh, it's got roundy corners, that's yeah. mine. Yeah. I, you know, my, I'll just tell you, I, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I, 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 I try very hard not to ever take sides because I never know who my next client's going to be. And, you know, obviously, what, who, the side I'm taking is... Is, um, is, is whoever my client is, but um, the, the, the verdict disturbed me, um, and it wasn't because they found infringement. Two things really bothered me. One, it's coming out more and more that they were ignoring prior art. The jury ignored prior art, and that really bothers me, and it's, it turns out it's very common. Uh, prior art, by the way, is, is, is inventions that predate the filing date of your patent. And um, it, it seems like there was a lot of prior art that they just didn't look at. Um, but second, the damages. I mean, often the problem isn't the infringement, it's the damages. And I read a great analysis of this case. Remember, there were three utility patents and one design patent. The design patent ended up being like 27%, but one of the patents was the rubber band. This, this, can I do it on this? Does it work? No. You know, when, when, you, when you have on your, on your iPhone and, and you, 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 um, you scroll down and it kind of bounces back, that, that, was, that was one of the patents. And I think, okay, okay, okay. That's neat. That's neat. And neat things deserve to be patented just as much as earth-shattering things. That's, that's a basic rule of patentability. As long as some kind of non-obvious improvement, that's fine. My problem is the damages. If you were to break down, take an iPhone or an iPad, and you broke down every single feature, and you assigned the same amount of money that the jury assigned to these, these three, these, these three um, patented features, um, apparently an iPad should be worth a million dollars. And it's worth a buck, you know, $199. Or, or I go, it's, it's a Samsung, a Samsung uh, device would, should, should you know, if you break it apart together, it should be a million dollars. Instead, it's a $200 device. And that's, and that's that's a problem not just with patent law. It's a pat, It's a problem with the whole any any time a jury gets gets involved, the numbers just seem to inflate. I don't know. I get the sense that sometimes it's like, hey, I spent a week doing this. Somebody's gonna pay. <laughs> oh. No, not really. 
Um, and patent law, and this is something that, that's ripe for reform, but patent law is very vague about, um, about damages. All the Patent Act says is that you get, at a minimum, a reasonable royalty. And then there are these 14, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have them memorized, but there's 14 what are called the Georgia Pacific factors, which include things like um, you know, evidence that, uh, that this feature is very important or evidence that um, it, there's been a long felt need for this or something like, uh, something like that. But you know, evidence that makes it, makes that would show how valuable this is. And you're supposed to imagine, for a reasonable royalty, you're supposed to imagine this, this, this hypothetical negotiation that can't ha ever happen, which is if the patentee, that is the guy who owns the patent, and the infringer were to, before, before the lawsuit, get together and have a negotiation, how much would the infringer have paid the patentee and how much would the patentee have taken from the infringer? The problem is you're supposed to ignore the fact the patentee has a patent. And you know the problem with the patent is, if, if my device has rubber band, say it's, that's the only thing, it's got rubber banding on it, and it's already out there, um, I can stop you from selling it. And suddenly, that little feature grows into this enormous block, which you're not supposed to take into account, but everybody does, because everybody keeps thinking, oh my god, if they don't have a patent, they can't even sell this thing. Of course, you know, Samsung can get around it going forward by getting rid of the rubber banding or whatever. Um, but, but yeah, there's, I mean, it's not so much math, I mean, math's hard, but it's just that, it's just that there's not a lot of instructions, and even if there were, there's no guarantee they're going to follow the instructions. Uh, my question is, so I saw that the patent office, I believe, tentatively uh, just basically said the patent was invalid for one of the patents. Yeah, one of the patents. So what happens if that patent is completely invalidated after the case? You know, it's never, it's not happened before, and a lot of us are wondering. Um, because this new post, what we call post-grant review, is relatively new. Um, it came, we've always had re-examinations, but they were hard to do. Um, the American Events Act of 2011 made it a lot easier. Um, I have to think, if the case is ongoing, if, if, if just applying basic litigation principles, the case is ongoing at that time, we don't have a final decision, then Samson should be able to go back to the court, ask for a uh, move to alter or amend. It seems like they should be able to. We've got a ways to go on that, and I'm curious to know what the uh, Court of Appeals will do. Yeah, they can, they can ask for a stay. Um, I don't think they have. Um, I tried looking at the docket. It's, a, it's kind of a bear of a docket um, because they, they file all kinds of stuff. These are, I, I know both law firms that are doing this. <laughs> they're, they're the sort of people who, well, you know, this is, this is, this is a perfect case. Um, this is a perfect case because the amounts of money involved, you know, lawyers look, whether a lawyer look is, is expensive or not depends on how much money is involved. And if a billion dollars is involved, suddenly lawyers look really cheap. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of throwing everything they can at it. But it looks like they haven't asked yet, but maybe it's a little premature. Because right now, they're at a position where they're asking the judge to step in and maybe um, reduce, reduce the award through something called remediator. Uh, so we're still at, at, at a stage where they're asking the judge to intervene and perhaps overturn some of the jury's findings. And, and then maybe, maybe once it goes on appeal, they will ask the Ninth Circuit to, to they'll, they'll appeal timely, then they'll ask the Ninth Circuit to stay. I, I'll be watching that because I, it's, not, it's never happened before. This is such a high-profile case. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go with that guy in the back and then, and then come to you. Uh, thank you. So there, was, there have been at least a couple of court cases where places like MapQuest have sued other mapping locations for having too similar of a route, even though in the very first case I remember, which was I think back in 2002 timeframe, um, the other company proved that they used a completely separate algorithm mm -hmm. to come to the same conclusion, but the judge still ruled in favor of MapQuest for saying, hey, look, you displayed the same route, so therefore there was a, an infringement. Um, do you know, uh, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with the case, but do you know if that was a patent or a copyright case? 
Okay. Um, because if it were a patent case, that would actually make a little bit of sense. Because patents cover functionality and ideas, so long as they're novel, non-obvious, and useful. And so long as they aren't describing a, a law of nature. And so with the patent, it wouldn't matter how you did it, so long as you did it, so long as you had the same functionality. Now, what's supposed to protect us from crazy, crazy patents is this novelty requirement. Um, but what we can talk a little bit later is with software patents, business method patents, um, the, the examiners are at a real disadvantage at, with, with finding prior art. Now, with copyright, if they use totally different code, they should have been okay because copyright protects the code, not the ideas. Um, and for a while there, it looked like copyright was going to just overtake patent way back in the early 90s, but, but now it's regarded as kind of a lesser way of protecting software. Uh, so if they use totally different code, that is, if they coded it separately without reference to MapQuest's code, um, they should have been okay. Um, I, don't, I don't remember those cases. I, perhaps in 2002, I was busy doing something else. Um, you, you I want to shift gears for a minute and talk about uh, statutes. Okay, are we, are we ready to shift gears? Yeah. You have, you have follow-up, okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know what case you're talking about. We're all on pins and needles um, about this. Is Kurt Sang? Do you mind if I talk about Kurt Sang for a minute? I love Kurt Sang. Um, okay. <laughs> By the way, I teach copyright at Vanderbilt, and I just taught this course, so I've got it kind of this case. So I've got it in my head. Um, all right. It's it's illegal to import copyrighted things without permission. Okay. All right. That's not a big deal. Um, it's amazing, though, what, what's, what? Why? It's just the, the law says so. Um, I, Congress passed a law and they said so. <laughs> but, well, the, 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 the reason, the policy reason is to avoid gray market goods. Okay, gray market goods. You know, if, it, particularly, Kurt saying great because it involves books. Um, you know, Thailand has a lower cost of living, so Wiley sells their books for less in Thailand. And so what they don't want is they don't want these cheap books being, re you know, be being imported into America and under undercutting the more expensive price, price point that we have here. So that's, that's the gray market. That's the that's gray market problem. That's kind of what it's supposed to do. But what's weird is what's, what, what's copyrightable. The first case of this, court, of, this, of this type was called Quality King. It involved hair care products. Wait, hair care products? That's how you copyright hair care products? Well, they didn't care about what was inside the can. They cared about the writing on the can. Well, it's copyrightable, I guess. And in, in Quality King, the products were manufactured here. They were then exported. And then somebody got them cheap and re-imported them. Supreme Court said that was OK. Because once you buy something, a copyrighted item, you, the first sale doctrine kicks in, and it's yours. You can do with it what you want. I mean, you can't copy it, but you can sell it, throw it away, do what you want with it, right? We'd go nuts if we didn't, wasn't such a thing. Um, and that's okay, right? With, with, with hair care products, once you've used up the mousse or whatever, you throw it away, who cares? Or you can resell the mousse, who cares? Okay, then Costco, the Costco case. Have you seen the Costco case? Okay. Omega watches. Okay, Omega uh, makes watches, and they made them overseas. Because things are now made overseas a lot more than they used to be, right? So now, the watches, what's copyrightable in about a watch? I mean, right? I mean, the typeface is not copyrightable because everybody does it, right? You can't, you can't get a monopoly on the typeface. So what, what unless Costco you're, Unless did, you're the Swiss rail system. Yeah, well, no, they have a trade, that was trade dress. And that was, that was a pretty strong case um, because that, that's been around for, again, like the Coke bottle. I mean, everybody's like, oh, wow, Swiss. <laughs> Omega put a little tiny crown. They, 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 took, they, they, they imprinted a little tiny crown on the back of their watches. That 
It's a work of art, right? That was the copyrighted, right, right, righted thing. Well, Costco got a hold of these gray market goods, tried to sell them. Omega um, sued, saying, hey, you imported, you wrongfully imported stuff with our copyright, our amazing little tiny copyright that you have to take off the watch and look very carefully to see. And, um, and, and, and Costco said, no, wait a minute. We bought these. First sale doctrine. And Omega said, no, nah, I am, I am. But you bought them overseas. That's your mistake. See, in Quality King, the first purchase was, ma was made in America. But here, the first purchase was made overseas. We made them overseas. You bought them overseas. First sale do doctrine doesn't apply until there's been an authorized sale. And it turns out the statute is totally unclear on this. They say the first sale doctrine applies to works lawfully made under this title. Nobody knows what that means. Does that mean does it have to be made in the United States or can it be made anywhere? Okay, well, good news. Bad, bad, the bad news is um, while the case was going up on appeal, Elena Kagan was working for the, um, uh, was, was the attorney general. No, she was solicitor general. She was a solicitor general. And so she made a recommendation against the Supreme Court taking up the case. Um, and you may have noticed the Obama administration tends to be kind of pro intellectual property rights. Um, I, I, it's probably not a coincidence because while if you look at the two pr recent presidential candidates, you know how one guy made his money, but Obama made most of his money selling books. So I always wonder, he's a little sympathetic, I think, with, with um, rights holders. Well, so unfortunately, by the time it got to the Supreme Court, Elena Kagan was actually on the court. So she had to recuse herself and it went 4-4 and the Ninth Circuit opinion stands, and that meant Costco was in good shape. And actually, Omega's now in trouble. They've been found um, to, to have misused their copyright. We're watching that one. That's an interesting one. OK, so Kurt Tsang. Kurt Tsang was this guy, Thai student, living in America, was tired. Have you guys, have you guys buy a textbook recently? Right? <laughs> it's wor By the way, it's worse if you're a law student. Everything's more expensive for the lawyers, I, I, I guess because we have tons of money. But, but, but textbooks are really expensive, right? I mean, they're super expensive. Um, they're, 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 so what he said is, he said, I know, he started buying textbooks from Thailand, same textbook. He'd buy them in Thailand and just bring them and use them. At, and then he had this great idea that he, all, he just to get all his old relatives to buy up all the textbooks in Bangkok and ship them to America. And he'd resell them to his buddies and then on eBay. And so he got sued for... Copyright infringement. Now here, at least, they're books and not little tiny indentations in a watch. And now, Elena Kagan is no longer recusing herself. So we will get to find out. Now, the problem is, the three, the three ways the court could go, none make any sense. One way the court could go is say, all right, they weren't made under this title. Therefore, until they're sold in America, the first sale document doesn't apply. Well, that would, now, the consequences for that, and Justice Breyer picked up on this right away, he said, that's funny, because if you were to buy a car, guess what's on the car? The car has a computer. What, is, what do computers have? They have software. What's software protected by? Copyright. That means we couldn't resell our own cars. That would be, that would be crazy. Things are made overseas now. A lot of things have software on them. People don't even know they're copyrighted. Um, but then, you know, the other option is, well, what about books? I mean, these books clearly ought to, you know, I mean, we generally don't like gray market goods. And so the, courts, the court was trying to find some middle ground where they say, oh, okay, okay, okay. Tell you what, um, the importation is illegal, but once it gets in the United States, you can resell. The, first, sort of, the problem is the statute's not set up like that. And so... I mean, the, the, some of the members of the court were, were trying to get to there, but, and that was the position of the United States, the, the intervening. Um, so there's some middle ground there. I think the court, because of what were called the parade of horribles, I think they're going to rule in Kurt Sang's favor, and then it's going to be up to the rights holders to go to, co to Congress and get this worked out. Because right now, it's, that's, my, that's my guess, that's my guess, that's my guess. The scary thing is it's 4-4. Last time we did this, it was 4-4. And Kagan, everybody thinks if Kagan was against the Supreme Court taking it, that means she was on the side of the rights holders. After all, she comes from an administration that's served on the side of the rights holders. So anyway, did I go on too long? But you have a follow-up, and then, and then you have a follow-up. Oh, 
I didn't answer your question. If they rule in favor of, of Wiley and they don't come up with some, if, if they don't come up with some way of, of limiting the holding, then it seems like we have a lot of really absurd results, and and this this would apply retrospectively, because, I mean, this is because basically the, co the court is is saying, hey, this is copyright law. This is what it's always meant. So. Um, it, it, I, I just I just can't imagine they'll they'll, they'll go that that way. Go with the hat. It's well, it seems to be where the transaction occurred because in. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, she's okay. Yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, cloud stuff. Um, yeah. The problem with okay, the thing about cloud stuff, it's not it's, it, it, it introduces a whole other raft of problems. But with mega upload, the, the thing there is, if you want to enjoy your digital content, you have to make copies of it. And copies don't fall within the first sale doctrine. First sale allows you to redistribute stuff that you buy, but it does not give you the right to copy it. And that makes digital content surprisingly different. So what's driving people nuts, for example, is you now get a book on Kindle. You get a book on Kindle. It used to be you buy a book with well, two things. Right? Once you buy the book, you can give it away. You can sell it. You can lend it. Library can lend it. But it also means you can read it. Well, with digital content, in order to read it, right, it has to go from one storage to another. Right? Am I right? Right? It has to go from um, a flash drive or a hard drive to some kind of RAM. And I understand there's maybe some caching involved, depending on the architecture. You have to make a copy. You have to make a copy just to use your book. If somebody yanks the license, suddenly you can't even read your, 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 your license. Now, we, there's been a lot of talk about this poor woman in Norway um, right, who had her Kindle account um, um, erased. It seems like what happened was she was in Norway and she bought it on Amazon in the United States and, and because of very complex contractual relationships that Amazon took a very conservative view about just the way the book industry works. Sometimes it ma what matters is the way the industry works and the industry sometimes does not operate in the most efficient way. So a Amazon was a little, I mean, they handled it badly but apparently it had to do with territorial rights amongst the book publishers. But the scary thing is, right, they can do it. I don't know. Yeah, you shouldn't have to. Yeah, yeah. You, you shouldn't have to. The nice thing about Apple, see, Apple has enough, has enough, um, uh, pow bar bargaining power um, that they tend to license all of these sort of normal uses you'd make of something you got at Apple are usually set forth in the amazing 50 page license. So for example, you're allowed to make, you know, to rip copies of songs you buy on iTunes. Um, you're allowed, it seems this way, I, I got some pushback, unlike Amazon, it seems like you're allowed to, at least Am Apple does not forbid reselling songs you buy on iTunes, although Amazon does. So, um, and there's some question, there's a cool, cool site called uh, Redigi that is trying to resell, let, let people resell digital songs that they, you know, they, they bought. And uh, there's a lawsuit going on there, I'm following that. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, what, what, what concerns me is that copyright has now entered a realm where it, it used to make intuitive sense, we all kind of knew what it meant, but with the introduction of digital content, it, it, it's no longer making sense to consumers, and I would like, you know, it, it, but it, it will take congressional action to, to, to reform it, because otherwise it's going to be case by case, fair use type analysis, and if fair use is your defense, you're, in, you're not in trouble, but you're, you're knee deep in it. Anyway, you're, you're, you've been waiting very patiently. No, that's all right, because <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to challenge Larry Lessig here. Um, and, um, please do. The, the, okay. <laughs>
So, I'm, and I'm also going to like bastardize Moore law, Moore's law here that says that, you know, technology is advancing at ever increasing rates. So, but yet the, the laws that govern specifically the terms of intellectual property keep getting longer and longer and longer. So, you know, citing the rubber band thing, for example, by the time that under, under copyright law, by the time that the rubber band issue becomes a public domain, we will have moved to probably, you know, digital, you know, cyborg technology. I mean, it, yes. it is no longer important. Right? Yeah, but so. Yeah, the 20-year the, the patent used to be short, it used to be considered a short period of time, but now it's 10 times longer than the technology is going to last. So Lessig started out thinking, okay, we're going to reform, we're going to reform intellectual property terms by going to Congress and going to the courts and saying, let's look at, you know, shortening these things down to something more realistic. Then mm -hmm. he discovered that the problem really wasn't, you know, the problem was business influence on the process that, that you know, in like, like in, the, um, in, the, in the case we were, you were just discussing earlier, uh, you know, if, if uh, uh, the, the publishing house wins or loses in the Supreme Court, which sounds like the more sane option, then their immediate response will be to buy Congress some, you know, some seats and you know, fund some campaigns well, and get they, they, they certainly lobby. They're, they're better at lobbying. They have better access. Right. So I guess the thing is, what what sort of action can be taken at a court level? I mean, what sort of action can be taken at a court level to sort of defend the notion of fair use in a more general way? Well, there's there's that. Um, and again, I mean, if nullification, nullification by the way is when a jury just says, I don't care what the law is, I really feel sorry for this guy and I'm not, not going there. Yeah, by the way, if you're wondering, who, Lawrence Lessig is a professor at Stanford, very, he basically, want, I mean, he, his most radical ways, he, he really wants to reduce the scope of intellectual property laws. He thinks we'd all be better off with less intellectual property. Um, since I, I live in Nashville, and I'm from Silicon Valley, I live in Nashville, so obviously I don't make sides because all, all my friends are like art you know, musicians and they, they like copyright, but I'm... All right, in the U.S. No, no, the, the fact that we have, no, that's, that's uncool. In the U.S., there's the general notion that a, an industry, a company, is not allowed to artificially manipulate the market, okay? Mm. Here's, here, here... There's I, the notion that I, it's I, not allowed to artificially manipulate the market. I just want to stop you right there, because the problem with copyright, and patent to a lesser extent, but especially copyright, is once you're in a copyright business, you're developing software, you're making music, you're painting pictures, um, you're writing novels. Once you're in a copyright biz, you are in a regulated field. Okay. Because copyright, without the Copyright Act, th there would be no protection at all. Congress could tomorrow, they won't, but in theory, right, they could just say, we're, 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 we're getting rid of the Copyright Act. I don't know what would happen, but... It, it, it could happen. So it's immediately, because the, the idea of copyright, the, the idea is sort of supposed to be we're going to create a kind of approximate market. So, and, and, we're gonna, and the tool we're going to give you to create this market is to give you the right to stop other people from doing certain things with your work. Um, but the thing is, you know, how, you know how, as soon as you do that, you're, you're, you're guessing at what, what, a, what a real market would have been. Well, and that, that kind of gets to the heart of the issue here is that I, and I honestly feel like there is, in the days when you had to actually had to cut down a tree, print paper, put it on a boat and ship, you know, a book, there was a certain amount of, of infrastructure and cost that had to go into doing that. Yep. And now yep. with digital goods, that is no longer the case. Yep. There is still a cost to transport those, that intellectual property from point A to point B, but it is a, a, a hyper-fraction yeah, of it, what it was 50 years ago. So what I see now is sort of big media building artificial scarcity into the system, well, into the economic model, in an attempt to raise prices. Yeah, well, there, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's how, it's, I mean, that's how tr copyright was, was designed, right? It's supposed to create a kind, because you can stop other people, you can control the, the supply. But you're right, there was also this sort of natural control, right? Because it was expensive to make these things, and it was expensive to copy them. And of course, now it's, it's, it's easy. And, and I think if you really want to get radical, I mean, I can think of some, of some imp major changes we could make. But if you really want to get radical, you can rethink the scarcity model. That's what Lessig is and, and the folks at the EFF and 
at least it, von, Lohmann okay before, von Lohmann before he went to go work for Google, um, are suggesting is that perhaps we should rethink the whole scarcity model of copyright. Um, I mean, you have to kind of go back, uh, get your hand up, I'll, I'll just, just, you can go back all the way to the copyright started in 1710, and the idea was, um, you know, if, if, if we didn't have copyright, it'd be so easy with the printing press. Uh, that was the first radical in, invention, right? It would be so easy to, to copy books that nobody would make money off it, and, and therefore nobody would, would want to write for, for a living. And, and that's, that's still the underpinning, the, the underlying economic model was this, this idea that we need to give authors, not the printing presses, but authors rights um, to, to stop copying so that they can control scarcity, make enough money during, at the time, it was a 14-year period, 1710, it was a 14-year copyright. Um, but just enough, the idea was, though, if, if, ever, if all the writers starved, it was okay so long as they felt just incentivized enough to write. And then in the later that century, in connection with the French Revolution, was this idea that authors are totally awesome people. They are magical, you know, unacknowledged legislators of the world, and they, they get extra special rights. And we've been living now in this kind of con conflict between this idea that authors are special people who get special rights, um, and perhaps should control whether you can burn a painting. Anyway, that's, that's the conflict. The Constitution of the United States specifically addresses copyright with a year. It, it does say for limited times. For, li for limited times. Okay. But you guys, you guys know that, by the way? 188? Yeah. 188. It's, it's what gives Congress the, right, the, the power. For, for a limited, for a limited period of time. Yeah, yep, it says right. limited. I know. You're, 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 thinking of L, L, you're thinking of Mickey Mouse case, basically. Well, but I'm also, thinking of, I'm also thinking of, can they radically change the nature of copyright as they have without actually a constitutional amendment? The, the answer is, tech, I mean, I think theoretically, no. One thing we learned about Eldred, okay, El, Eldred was this case, you know, every time Steamboat Willie comes about to fall into the pu public domain, copyright gets extended. Okay? Isn't that in like two years or something? Well, it's, no, no it was getting close, but no, they, 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 they tacked on another 25 years, so, so the, it, it'll be a while before this comes up again. Um, and, and uh, by the way, I have an aside, and again, I don't take sides, but one thing that does annoy me is that, go think, I, I'm a Disney nut, by the way. I love Disney cartoons. I watch them with my kids. But what do you think of, name all the Disney features that are original, based on original stories. So two or three of them. The rest of them are in the public domain. They, they have taken things in the public domain, and oh, they don't want to put them yeah. back. And then that's, that was, that's kind of supposed to be the deal. You can borrow from the public domain, but then it goes back to the public domain. The yeah, there you go. By the way, good, good um, uh, uh, Pullman wrote a, uh, just did a good, great translation of the Grimm fables, if you're into that. Um, but yeah, I mean, Snow, but these are fairy, the fairy tales, the fairy tales, um, right? Victor Hugo, right? He, he gets, he was in the public domain. Um, I, I, anyways, I think it's three. I, I think it's three. Um, you know, the Lion King was original. No. The the really the really really crummy adaptation of the Black Cauldron, that was still under copyright. But God, it's a terrible movie. Great book. God, terrible movie. And what would what would be the third one? Fantasia. Oh, well, they might they might have they might have. Gosh, that, that's maybe I never heard that, but that's that's probably and Pinocchio. These are all in the public domain. Um, but, 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 uh, uh, but anyway, to answer your question, sorry. Um, Eldred also said that the First Amendment, there's no such thing as a First Amendment right, uh, a defense to copyright. And it's, because it's weird, because you have, because First Amendment's an amendment's in the Constitution, but so is the Copyright Clause. But they also said, the reason why there's not a First Amendment, um, defense to cop, to copyright is that fair use and what is called the idea expression dichotomy were the two safety valves that protected our freedom of expression. And if we were to ever monkey with those two things, with, with the scope of fair use and the idea expression dichotomy, then the Constitution would have something to say. 
Now, as far as the, cost, the copyright clause, it seems pretty clear that so, so long as n is less than infinity, I mean, if, if we, we read Eldred, if n is less than infinity, Congress can keep extending copyright. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's uncool. Um, anyway, this, you've been waiting very patiently. So my daughter has built a, a, an arc reactor uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the scope of Iron Man. Okay. And it's, it's just LEDs and a little processor to make them dance. If she wanted to put this on Kickstarter, um, at what point does she begin infringing on the trademarks that are involved? Oh because boy. she's not going to say, oh, this is Tony Stark's yeah. arc reactor, yeah. oh boy. but she's going to convey that idea that it's an arc reactor that you could wear. Yeah, I don't, um, okay, I can't give specific legal advice because I'm, I'm not your or your daughter's lawyer and we haven't developed a attorney-client um, uh, relationship. <laughs> I was going to say, I've got you, a buck. <laughs> right, we, we can talk about my, my billing rate af a afterwards. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, that, that dollar? It, it just, yeah, that's over. Um, okay, it's funny, because um, I just was on the phone on Friday with Marvel characters, lawyers who were telling who were telling me to go screw myself, in a very nice way. They're very nice people, um, but um, they obviously think that that they're weak, weak ass case. But they're big enough; it doesn't matter. So right now, I, I, number one, I'd say I'd be scared of these people, um, and I think that they would they would say they have a trademark in that. Now the question is, question is on, on trademark. The question is. Is there a likelihood of consumer confusion, or is this a fair use? Is it is it sort of a fair use? Is it kind of a fan fair use? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, the question is: Is anybody going to think that your daughter is affiliated with Marvel or with Marvel's owner? Disney, by the way, is a little bit of a lawsuit about whether Disney actually bought all the intellectual property. That's totally screwed up, and I might go talk to those lawyers. Um, a connection with what happened on Friday, um, but but you know there there is an there there is an issue, um, and people trademarks are funny. Some people have very expansive ideas of what trademarks are. Monster Cables has sued everybody who uses Monster, and they usually lose. But still, because what happens is lawyers will tell you, they the, the thing about trademark is because it it, it exists through use, if you stop using it, it will weak atrophy and eventually die, okay? And, and the mark will go back in the public domain. Lawyers like to tell people that they must keep, if they don't enforce police their trademark, their trademark will, will have a heart attack and die, a little different than atrophy and die. And so some companies sue quite a lot. You know, Starbucks, of course, sued Charbucks. Monsters, uh, which I, I forget even what happened in that case. Um, I know Starbucks lost at first, but it went back, got remanded. Um, so I, I, I would be, I, you know, the law, of course, lawyers are by, were by nature risk adverse. I'd be nervous. Okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you're not wanting to go in this particular direction or I, I didn't ask it very clearly, but if she just calls it an arc reactor, Mm -hmm. And she doesn't say it's an Iron Man arc reactor or well, anything like that. that. That's what I'm sort of looking at. If she's oh, not branding it with gosh. the movie, yeah. if she's just saying, gosh, I've got a, an arc reactor. I don't, thing. well, help me out. Is arc, arc reactor, the question is going to come down to It's the whether, shiny thing in his yeah, chest. Yeah, but is the word, <laughs> I guess, is the word arc reactor, was that invented by Jack Kirby? I think it was. Okay, so... Yeah. <laughs> Does it matter that there's no competing product issue that could be used Um unfortunately not really. It used to matter. It used to be that you need to have direct competition and and with the Lanham Act um now it's been expanded to um affiliation or sponsorship. So, so even if I'm not competing with you, if it looks like this is something that, um, you know, that, that Marvel might get into, 
then that's, that's close enough. Then you mentioned dilution, which is where you have a famous mark. And I don't, this isn't famous. I, I feel like I'm pretty confident with that. Famous would be Coke, McDonald's, Nike. Kle uh, Kleenex is, well, Xerox and Kleenex, although they, they're, they're, those are cellophane, which has now been, gen it's called genericide, which is where if you use a strong mark to mean the generic thing, the mark dies. That's called genericide. Um, uh, well, that's just it. I mean, Q-tips, uh, Johnson Johnson would prefer that you not refer to generic Q-tips as Q uh, <laughs> generic, cotton generic cotton tip swabs <laughs> as, 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 as Q-tips. Um, so, but yeah, that's, 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 um, that's, that's genericide, but so I think the question is, is affiliation, is it sponsor, is, does it look like affiliation, does it look like sponsorship? If she, if she does it on it for fun, that's one thing. Kickstarter is a little more public. There's money maybe involved. And I think that might, that might get some people's attention. And, and I'm, I've lear I'm learning to be a little scared of Disney's lawyers. I've gone, gone against them twice. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, sorry. Every, everybody is pointing, sorry. Oh, everybody's pointing at this guy. And I, I, wonder, I wonder if I'm going to regret this. Bayer, Bayer, which is a German yep. company, that the U.S. government actually encouraged that to become a generic term and break the trademark. Yep, yep. Aspirin's a another example of uh, genericide, and yes, there was, a, there was a political edge to that one. We, nobody, nobody cried at the time. Uh, um, I think, you know, um, Johnson, is it Johnson Johnson also on that one? I think they would prefer that you refer to it as a s s adhesive bandage. You know, this gets back to why fair use is important, because at some point, well, products, services, and ideals become part of our common vernacular and how we well, communicate ideas. That, that's what's, it, 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 fair use is, is important. My problem with fair use I mean, I love fair use. My problem with fair use is that you come to me and you say, well, can I do this? And I say, well, there are four factors, and we look at this, and we look at that. You know, if everything works according to, to plan, it might be okay. Or public domain, I meant to say public domain. Oh, public domain, yes. Yeah. Things, yeah. Well, it would be nice if things could fall into the public domain. Copyright just, just doesn't look like it's going to happen. Trademarks will, can. They last forever, so long as you keep using them. But... Obviously, there's lots of trademarks that have fallen into the public domain, which you're not really allowed to do with genericide. The reason why genericide there is you're not allowed to take a generic term and make a trademark out of it. You can't sell Apple brand apples. You can sell Apple brand computers, but not Apple brand apples. You see what I mean? Um, guy way in the back, so I, you haven't asked anything. OK, in my work, I. I take stuff apart and figure out how it works. Oh, are you, you the guy back when I, where I back where I parked? <laughs> Maybe. There was a guy who was to sort of take it apart. Yeah. Okay, so let's say I work on vehicles. Oh boy. Okay. And I want to repair a certain component on the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I need to know how it works. Yeah, yeah. And this device also has software on it. Now the software says in the code it says copyright by Ford mm -hmm. Motor mm -hmm. Company. Well. I'm I'm not reselling it or anything like that. How has it traditionally been viewed by the courts when a company has reverse engineered something? I'm not copying what yep. they made. Yep. I'm simply repairing it or modifying it. We do have case law on that. Um, courts have been very sympathetic with reverse engineering and interoperability. Um, the Sega case um, where somebody, in order to make a competing product, bought a Sega, um, it was a Saturn operating system, a, a console game system, and in order to make a competing product, actually, took the, the code, the, the firmware, and re reverse engineered to see how it worked. And the court said, reverse engineering is something we encourage, because we like competition. And we're trying to, um, and so long as the, the code that comes out at the end is totally different, we will allow some intermediate copying necessary for you to create non-infringing code. Um, now, there is also in the statute, and I don't have my, my, my statute book with me, there is a 
provision that's meant to help people repair machinery. Um, it's, if the statutory exceptions are often very narrow, but the, the idea is that sometimes you have to make a copy of something so you can fix it. You know. DRM, okay. You know, I, I'm assuming we don't have, we don't have D, uh, any DRM on this thing. DRM falls under the anti-circumvention provisions of the um, DMCA. Now, DMCA is sort of mixed bag. Um, um, and the idea is if, if, you, it, it certain, if you get around even, even lame D, DRM mechanisms, it's supposed to be illegal. Um, and that's, the funny thing is, is the market has sort of spoken on DRM. I mean, market was, I mean, DRM used to be a lot more common than it is now. And what's funny is Apple, people used to rag on Apple because they had DRM. And it turns out Apple hated having DRM, um, but, but they felt, they, they didn't feel like that was something they could win at the time. And when they, remember when the prices went up to $1.29, right? That's when they revised the, um, the, 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 the license and the DRM went away. And so did that provision that said you may not resell. Because a Apple, their attitude is happy customers. The rights holders might feel differently, but Apple's. But so the, I, I, feel like, I feel like the market has spoken on that. But yeah, the, you know, anti-circumvention is still a law. I don't see as much. We saw a bunch like in the early 2000s, but we don't see, it, see that much anymore. That's also supposed to be illegal to, to have a, even a device that not not any criminal ones, and I can't think of any I can't think of any major civil ones. That's okay. For, First Amendment helps you out there. So yeah, isn't that funny? You you can tell people how to do it, you just can't do it. But the idea the idea though is the First Amendment is supposed to be that. By telling people how to do it, you're also making a political statement that this should be legal, right? So that's why the First Amendment, you know, is is you know sticks its nose in there. Um, I don't know anything uh, about that. You should be able to say. You should be able to tell people how to do things, yeah. unless, it, unless it was another country. Oh, did it have source code in it? Yeah, because source code would be under copyright, and you can't, you, you can, of course, quote from the source code, and then the fair use fits in there. I don't know why, but yeah, I'd love to hear about it, if you, can, if you could tell me more about it, um, because I, that's the sort of thing I, I try to keep tabs on. It's just hard to keep tabs of everything, even from, you know, Nashville, which is the center of everything. Um, well, it's a nice, I, you know, it's a nice town. I miss, I miss Silicon Valley, but I, I love living here. Yeah. There there's a situation where a recording artist had a song, they owned the copyright to it. Uh, another company used their song in a commercial of theirs, copyrighted the commercial, put it on YouTube, yeah. and then the artist posted their song on YouTube, and then the artist who owned the rights had, a, had theirs automatically taken down. Yeah, and okay, the person okay. who, who yeah. did the commercial didn't yeah. even pay them for yeah. the rights to it. So, so, so obviously, I don't, I don't even have to tell you, right now you know that the, the, the person who, who the, the person who owns the copyright in the song, songs by the way have two copyrights. There's the songwriter copyright and the artist copyright, right? Copyright in the music and copyright in the sound recording. Um, but the rights holders obviously had superior rights. But um, we are in an era. I, I actually am a DMCA agent. It's kind of it's kind of an interesting job. You get a lot of very angry people calling you. Um, I charge a lot for it because it's. It's psychically difficult. Um, but um, so but the problem is DMCA is, is hard on everybody. Um, the rights holders have to, you have to you know, fill out, you know, you have to fill out a form and send it on to the right person. And the, the, the hosting, right, the, the internet service provider has to have somebody, and they have to take it down expeditiously, and it's a pain. 
It's a pain on both sides. So they've developed software. Audio magic is the most common, but there's other, other forms that, that automatically detect. They're supposed to be automatically detecting things that are copyrightable and will automatically take them down. And for the most part, they seem to do a pretty good job, but they're, they're not, they can be pretty dumb when it comes to a situation like that. They can't tell who has the superior right. That takedown happens outside of the framework of the DMCA. Yes, and here's the thing, though. Just because it happens outside the framework of the DMCA doesn't mean it's illegal. DMCA is just a way of, basically what the DMCA says is, you, 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 ISP, you hosting company, you would be contributorily liable for copyright infringement for hosting this copyrighted material, but we're going to let you off the hook if you do A, B, and C. Um, but they can, if they want, they can take stuff down on their own if they want, if they just want to be careful or, or, or whatever, so long as if they're smart, they'll have a contract with their users saying, we can take stuff down whenever we want. And for what it's worth, you know, as a hacker, I, I like the notice of the takedown system in the DMCA because at least that gives you, because you can file a counter notice and have it yeah. back up. A lot of people don't realize that if that happens, the right holder can, uh, or if you think it was a fair use or something, you can put it back, you can, you can send a, note, a counter notice to the same guy, same DMCA agent. The downside is, you have to give yourself away. Yeah. You have to give yourself away to say, I live here, basically. I live here. If you want to sue me, here I am. That's, that's the exchange. So, but a lot of people don't even know they have that right. And, and the problem is, is the, the amount of time involved, what if it takes two weeks? And what if, it's, what if it's something that's only worthwhile for a couple of days? Like, you know, something that was supposed to happen today, you know? Oh, well, well actually, what was the, the Neil Gaiman thing? Right? Who, who remembers that? Um, Neil, remember Neil Gaiman was giving a, a, a presentation. He was give, given an award, and he had, um, they were going to show the, uh, 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 the, the, the Doctor Who. Wasn't it? Well, they're going to, they're going to, yeah, but they're going to show, because he, he's written, he's written the, uh, a script for a, a new Doctor Who episode, and I think they're going to show the trailer, and there was a mix-up on the, on the, on the, um, on the automatic takedown software, and in the middle of this presentation, and it's also being webcast everywhere, there was a sign saying, this has been taken down because of a copyright violation. And, 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 and there was Gaiman kind of going, you know, I'm not as cool as Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, that's not the way I interpret the, the, the Section 512 of the Copyright Act. Um, I, I think YouTube always has the right to take down anything that they want. The terms of services are pretty clear on that. Um, you know, before you upload anything, you have to accept a, a, a contract, and they make it clear they can take stuff down. And if they, and I've heard that rumor that like they, 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 if they take it down, they'll, they'll affect their DMCA status, and I don't, I don't get that at all. Now, I know... I know some of their copyright lawyers there, and they're smarter than me, but I, I don't see that um, at all. I, I, they, I think they have the right to take it down if they want it to. The question is, you know, to, to, them, to me it's just an internal question. Do they, do they want to, you, know, is, is, you know, is it fair use? You know, I mean, is it, is it you know, free speech that they want to support, or, or do they, are they worried about their behinds? But that's, that's their decision. And of course, the problem with Google, what's interesting about Google and Amazon and these companies is what I call the, um, the private commons. These are, these are, these are places in, 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 on the internet. Um, lawyers still call it cyberspace, by the way. Um, 
Yeah, they still call it that. Um, which seem like public commons, but are actually owned by Google or owned by Amazon, and you can be kicked off. Um, and, and it's sort of surprising because you feel like it's your place, and then it turns out they, they kick you off. And it's, that's also another, I think, dis, uh, situation where, where, where consumers and the law are at a, a, at a disconnect. Yeah. I, I, I think the precedent there, though, is really a consumer precedent, not a legal precedent. I mean, basically, they just don't want people knowing that they'll, that they'll, they'll cave in. And that's, you know, that makes, that makes sense. But that's not a legal position. That's just a, um, that's just, just, that's a business decision, really. Yeah. And I, I, by the way, are we, I mean, somebody coming here at five? We're supposed to go no, there's another. There's one. There's another talk. There's somebody waiting to come in, and we don't want to delay past lunch. So if we could wrap up the questions, maybe one more, and all and right, talk to him offline. You get your hand up. Yes. Yeah. That was yeah. That was interesting. Um, so so yeah. Um, and I, again, I have I have clients that do this because it's easier. It's just easier. You give the rights, major rights holders, if you trust them, access to the, the, the takedown panel. And they don't, you know, and I, I, now we, I always advise my clients to say, but we, we still need a DMCA takedown notice. Um, so we know, so, so, because we want you to, to, the nice thing about the takedown notice is you have to swear that you have a good faith basis for taking it down. And I, we, my, I, I try to encourage my clients to insist on that. But still, you know, it's a pain. If you're the host, it's a pain to, to be the one taking it down. So why not let, if, if you trust the rights holder, why not let them do it? Uh, what was weird, though, what was Google, Google and, what was the situation? Google and a, and a major rights holder got into a spat, a public spat over, universal. it was universal. But what was, what was the, the because when, when Jim.com hired the yeah, yeah, yeah. Took took it down. It took it down, and then and then and, you, and then, Universal said they had a contractual right, to do that. Google said no, um, that's not our contract. And then I think the embarrassing thing is that Google then published, publicized the contract. Yeah. I, Google looked bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Google Google looked bad. That's right. It was it, 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 yeah. At the time, because at the time. This is right before they got indicted. Meg Upload actually was suing. Was actually on the was on the offensive. I think my old firm, my old firm was, was representing uh, Fenwick and West, was representing um, Meg Upload at the time. Um, yeah, cloud comp cloud computing is a. Right now, I, all I do is I pray that whenever I deal with a cloud computing case, that all the servers are somewhere in the United States. <laughs> I mean, that's that's that's. And, and copyright is just one of many issues. Well, yeah, that's. Okay, well, you, you guys have been a great audience. You had great questions. I hope I answered them. I, I talked a little fast because um, you were asking questions that I was really interested in. So um, I appreciate that. And. Um, um, you know, you can if you if you have questions, you can uh, shoot me shoot it to me on on. Um, oh, there's our platypus. You can you can follow follow me on 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 on, on Twitter and ask me questions there, or just just look up our website, Aaron and Sanders, AaronSandersLaw.com. That's us. <laughs>